I'm Karen Wigan and delighted to be here with you all. We wanted to start right off by acknowledging the incredibly generous support and innovative infrastructure that David Rumsey and Abby Rumsey have brought to Stanford along with a massive map collection, which really inspired both Carolyn and I to begin teaching in that facility and then get excited when we discovered that both of us were looking for any excuse we could to spend more time there. We hatched the idea for this volume at a luncheon for women faculty in history on campus right at the faculty club and we really rolled with it. We had a conference in the David Rumsey Map Center in 2017 where we brought nine authors together and each one contributed a chapter to this volume. And thanks to a publication subvention from the Rumseys, I am proud to say that the book we're about to introduce to you has a combination of scholarly rigor with coffee table production values. It's really a beautiful book and the maps are reproduced at a large size and full color and very sharp. And that was really important to us because both of us have been drawn into the study of maps, not only for their intellectual fascination, but also for their beauty. I don't wanna waste a whole lot of time, but I do wanna highlight that among the points that emerged for us that we wanted to really hope that this volume would make a singing resounding argument for was above all the insistence that even in the digital age, paper map maps have enormous value and particularly particularly when it comes to how maps tell stories about time, whether that's the past, the future, trajectories change over time, there are actually advantages to paper maps because our eyes can roam across their surface in a nonlinear way. We can linger over features that we're interested in. We can dilate on the areas that might be most important. Whereas an animated sequence in the new digital technology kind of puts us on a track and we have to just go forward. Um, what we really enjoyed was seeing how ingeniously cartographers in the age before digital mapping had been able to play with time. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Carolyn or hand this off to Carolyn and let her begin with the first of four themes that we thought would be of interest to you all today. Wonderful. Thank you, Karen. Uh, and let me just add my uh, appreciation for the Rumseys and appreciation for all of your attendance today. We're so delighted to be spending some time um, with you. So the, we're going to just plunge right in with a section of two maps called Diagramming Time. And these are not actually maps of particular places on the planet Earth, but they are in fact diagrams, which historians define as working objects, objects that do things for us, that explain things for us. Um, the first one you see here is Emma Willard's Temple of Time. Emma Willard is one of the great educators of 19th century America, and she was very, very sad that history um, was often taught in a way that she thought was very boring and unmemorable. And so she wanted to teach the young uh, men, but also the young women of America, how to understand time in a way that that was more memorizable. So she devised this extraordinary temple of time, uh, which takes the form of a Greek temple. And it starts at the very beginning of time, which you can see at the far back uh, end, which for Emma Willard was the creation uh, of human beings in the Garden of Eden in exactly 4004 BC. And as you can see, she unrolls the history of all humanity uh, from that point forward. So there are uh, great people, uh, influential people like Napoleon and Simon Bolivar represented in columns. There are also trends, uh, religious changes, the whole history of humanity uh, set out before young people so that they could understand not only uh, the place of uh, themselves in the world, but more importantly, the place of the new United States in the world. Next slide, please. The second diagram in this series is, of course, the geological time spiral that was so extraordinary to us that it uh, bedecks the jacket of the book. This was made by the United States Geological Survey in 2008, and it represents 
uh, the unfolding or rather the uncurling of geological time from 4.6 billion years ago up until the present day, which to my great delight as somebody who grew up on a beach in Southern California is represented by a surfer dude, uh, which we show you with the arrow here. But again, this is not a particular place on Earth. It is rather using the metaphor of the Earth to show all of the changes of life as it unfolds during the very, very long history of the Earth. By the way, this is in the public domain. You can Google it uh, and you can um, uh, go in closely to see all of the wonderful details that are in this map. Off to you, Karin. Okay, great. So a second theme that we discovered many of our contributors had actually been exploring because many map makers have worked with it is movement through space. In other words, migration in particular. And here we have a second image created by Emma Willard, who Carolyn was just talking about, this very creative pedagogue teacher. And one of the discoveries, by the way, of working with historical maps has been that a lot of them were created by teachers for, for conveying information to students. This is really one of the main uses of them. So here we have Emma Willard's map of indigenous migrations in what will become the United States. So we begin here our series of maybe half a dozen, just a tiny sample tip of the iceberg of the 100 color images in this book of maps proper, moving away from diagrams of time to maps. And what could one observe about this map? Well, you might be interested to know the context in which it was published. It appears as effectively the preface to the first American historical atlas ever published. And she puts it in a almost a prehistory section before the, the maps of European colonization proper begin. So there's a sense in which this is bracketed apart from American history. It is the preamble. It's the, it's the creation of the foundation of the foreground. In terms of migration, we do see some arrows used on this. This became a very common, initially uh, a, an idiom or icon that suggested movement of streams of air and water first, but then was transferred to movement of people and commodities over the course of the 19th century. It's so conventional now, we hardly notice it, but her use of arrows was still somewhat innovative at the time. And you do get a sense of American Indians being on the move, somewhat nomadic, but yet having locational specificity as well. And there's an attempt to delineate relationships among tribes through the colors. But you notice there really are no tribal boundaries here. It's a very generalized geography of approximate locations of these peoples at, at some vague moment across maybe a thousand years of pre-American history. So there's a kind of unboundedness. And I would say the function of a map like this, especially if you notice the palimpsest that she's put in, the little dashed lines showing where the American state boundaries will come in after colonization. Um, the function of a map like this is effectively to help to justify colonization and dispossession of these peoples on the grounds that, well, they were fairly mobile anyway. They weren't firmly rooted to place which we now know is not an accurate representation of indigenous American nations and their relationship to territory. This makes a very interesting contrast. This is the second map we wanted to show you under this theme. It's certainly one of the most vivid and I think arresting maps in the whole corpus that we showed. It comes from a chapter on Aztec mapping. And this is a map made not by colonists of the people they were colonizing, but rather of a colonizing indigenous people to justify their own dispossession of other people uh, who had inhabited the Valley of Mexico before they got there. It begins, I'll bring my arrow onto the screen so you can see this, this is where the map actually begins. If you wanna follow it in its uh, temporal sequence, there's a, it's a little bit hard to see. We should have maybe done a magnified image for this one too, but there are tiny little black footprints within this ribbon of a road that indicates the journey of the founders of Tenochtitlan, what will become Mexico City in the Valley of Mexico, out of their homeland, which by this time, by the time this image was made was already somewhat in the mythological dim past. But they pass a series of images like this, which are glyphs for the villages or towns or areas in which they stopped. 
uh, with markers next to that indicating the duration of time that they spent there. And also occasionally as you wind through this, images showing major events that happened. And what's most dramatic is if you follow this around all the way here to where they actually come into the Valley of Mexico, the images, you'll notice the humans in the map actually flip upside down. So the orientation of the map changes. And this lower quadrant, which depicts their entrance into and conquest of the Valley of Mexico, which is a very flooded marshy area. You can see all these little green um, symbols suggesting uh, the marshlands. Um, that is magnified and shown in much more detail. And one other intriguing contrast I thought that I might just mention between this map and the Emma Willard one is the celebration and acknowledgement of the violence of this conquest. And Barbara Mundy, the art historian who wrote, writes about it in the book, is very clear that for them, this was how the world was made through acts of conquest and acts of, of taking over and making the land. All right, that's two very contrasting images. I guess I'll add just a footnote that the one we're looking at here is not the original map, which is hundreds of years old and in rather bad shape. This is a facsimile that was created to be inserted in the first historical atlas of Mexico. So it occupies a very interesting position uh, respective to the Emma Willard one that preceded seated it. And then we move on to a, another theme, change over time. Carolyn? Wonderful, yeah. Uh, we have a couple maps in this change over time uh, theme to share with you. So we can go to the first one here, which is a map of, uh, as you see in the top right-hand corner of the map, what they call Egypte Ancienne, Ancient Egypt. This is a French map uh, by the great French cartographer and geographer Paul Vidal de la Blache, and it is a, a single page from his extraordinary atlas uh, that is teaching the French about the world uh, according to France. You've all seen that New Yorker cartoon that shows uh, the United States as seen from New York. Well, this is the world as seen from late 19th century France, which is beginning to expand its imperial presence around the world. This is what we call a snapshot map. This map of, quote, ancient Egypt in a single frame is showing you 3,000 or so years of Egyptian history all collapsed into one single frame as though you had a camera that you left open for that amount of time. So there's all these kind of um, romantic images of ancient Egypt that come to the foreground for the French viewer who is recalling with delight uh, the Napoleonic conquest of Egypt a mere hundred years before and showing a kind of unchanging view of who the ancient Egyptians were. The idea being that modern Egypt is merely a location for the conquest uh, by France of the modern world, but the ancient world itself, at least in Egypt, is this unchanging monolith whose particularities uh, as we go through the various uh, pharaonic dynasties don't need to be understood very particularly, but that rather can be grasped in a single frame. Uh, so again, we call this the photocinematic idiom. And in the book itself, we have a number of representations of this kind of uh, uh, sort of mapping of the past. We can go to the next one. All right, this is one of two slides of the same uh, map. The next one is going to be a close up. This is one of an extraordinary series of roughly 20 maps that were created by Harold Fisk, who worked for the Army Corps of Engineers and who was responding to a, a massive flood of the Mississippi in the 1920s that was then and remains today one of the most destructive river floods in United States history. 
the Army Corps of Engineers deemed it imperative to begin to control this mighty river uh, that extends for hundreds of miles. And what they began to do was to launch a series of essentially airplane flights over the Mississippi River Valley uh, and geological excavations on the ground itself to represent what you see here, which is the um, eloquent and sensual undulations of this mighty river over the last 2000 years. And those are what uh, those uh, colorful bands are that you see. Uh, the least interesting aspect of this image is the modern day Mississippi, which recedes into this sort of boring white snake in the middle of the image. What our eyes are drawn to is uh, the colorful bands that, uh, that kind of scatter chaotically around the sides. Um, and before I begin talking about this, I'll just make one more observation. If that image looks to you like a piece of abstract art from the middle of the 20th century, you are absolutely right in thinking that. Uh, aerial photography uh, was highly influential for the creation of uh, what we today call abstract art. So people flying over cornfields, people flying over uh, the roads and railways that uh, bisected the nation into a series of new lines and indeed over uh, river valleys created these kind of um, very uh, regular, uh, but also irregular images that we know as abstract art. Okay, now we can go to the next one, Card. This is a close up. I love this because, so we did the photo, photo cinematic uh, idiom uh, just a minute ago with the map of ancient Egypt. This image, the close up, shows you how time in maps can also be a metaphor for the functioning of human memory. So you'll see these large red undulations are the most ancient of uh, the, um, the paths of the Mississippi River. And over time, those paths are covered by the river as it becomes. Uh, as it moves through time. And this, of course, is like our own memory that we have very, very distant memories from when we were just three or four years old, but they are, um, they are patchy and covered by later memories in the way that these red, uh, very, very ancient undulations are covered by more modern ones. So the book, um, by showing these, these representations of time in maps, is also a meditation of, of how our own minds work, of how we perceive the world, how we are limited in our perceptions of, of time in the world by our own, uh, by our own cognition. Back to you, Karin. That was so much fun and a great setup for this last pair of images we'll show you, which we've captioned time travel for reasons I hope you can understand. In a sense, one of the functions that our contributors honed in on again and again that historical maps can and do perform for us. And one of the reasons that they give many of us a lot of pleasure is that they allow imaginative virtual travel uh, for armchair readers to be able to make leaps that they may not be able to make in real life, very much as Zoom technology is allowing us to do this morning. So we have two examples here at the end from the country that I study, Japan. And there's a special side note I wanna make about this. Japan, during the early modern period, which is from the 1600s to the mid 1800s in the case of the Japanese uh, archipelago, had one of the most exuberant, vibrant mapping cultures anywhere on the world. And what supported that was a big dense population that was highly urbanized had a commercial market that was very well developed, had high levels of literacy compared to other parts of the world, and was a print saturated society. And so these maps, the last two that I'll show you, come out of the same context as the floating world or ukiyo-e prints of geisha and sumo wrestlers that you've probably seen, as well as landscape prints. And in fact, they were made by graphic designers, very beloved graphic designers in Japan who are now globally famous. This particular one was made by Hokusai, 
the ukiyo-e master who created the probably the single most famous image that's ever come out of Japan, the Great Wave, uh, which was also part of his 36 views of Mount Fuji series, but he was incredibly prolific. Over the course of his 90-year uh, life, he created 30,000 artworks. So this is a large map on which he spent more time than some of the quick cartoon sketches that are among those 30,000. But this was, this was actually kind of a landmark map. It represents, uh, as it says, a panorama of famous places or Meisho from China. And China at the time this map was made, which is in the early 19th century, was completely off limits to Japanese. The country wasn't completely closed to books and artworks and occasional visitors from outside, but Japanese people were forbidden from leaving the country. And yet their education, if they were literate, informed them deeply about and pulled them imaginatively toward the, the kingdoms of ancient China. So in some ways, I would urge you to put this one in your mind side by side with the map that Carolyn discussed earlier of ancient Egypt. I think this kind of image functioned for literate, educated Japanese very much the way Paul Vidal de Lablache's image of ancient Egypt might have functioned for French readers at not too, not too different of a time in, in history. The image is saturated with place names as was the ancient Egypt map, which would have only made sense to people who had learned a lot about the history of China, but for those people, they would have immediately summoned resonance in the same way that the names of Luxor or Thebes uh, would have for the French who had been following the great archeological discoveries in the Valley of the Pyramids at Valley of the Kings. Um, it, it is studded with also some representations of famous places, including the one we've called out here, which is Mount Song, a, a mountain that is probably as saturated with religious and poetic sites and symbols as any single landmark on the Chinese landscape. And that's why it's so tall, that that's a function of its cultural altitude, not of its physical altitude. The Great Wall is actually hinted at up here at the top. You can see it right along the edge of what this map is including, which interestingly, I might also point out, is the territory of China during it, the ancient period, uh, during the Tang Dynasty, a thousand years before the map was made, this is only about half of the terrain that the Qing Dynasty, which was coeval with the, the Tokugawa during which it was made, actually occupied. So there's nothing of Xinjiang, the Mongolia, um, Manchuria, none of that region is shown on this map. We're just interested in the heartland of traditional China. And I just also want to point out something I'm sure that hits you emotionally, if not intellectually, as soon as you look at this the softness, the romantic shading of these blues uh, and the kind of softness of the forms of the mountains. This is all, I think, a very romantic, nostalgic evocation of a landscape that's far away in both space and time, but very dear to the hearts of the people who would have been viewing it. And finally, to address uh, the historical context out of which it grew, one more important piece to share with you is that this image is the only bird's eye view we have of a place outside of Japan made within Japan during this period. We have lots of bird's eye views or panoramas of Japanese landscapes, but it's the only one of China. And it would have been impossible without an intense, almost frenetic uh, atlas and map making, and, effort that went on during the late 18th and early 19th century by historians and cartographers of China. So it, they were the ones who figured out the spatial relationships, transcribing material from Chinese, creating giant wall-sized paper maps of China, which then this creative graphic designer took and reshaped into a more evocative literary image for his audience. And this became a very popular image at the time. And it creates a really, I think, nice contrast with the very last time travel image that we wanted to share with you. Uh, this actually can be viewed now or one copy of it because many survive in the British Museum. Uh, it's a very long, maybe five feet long uh, image. So it's a very commanding view as if you're looking out of a hot air balloon which was a contemporary tool of cartography in the late 19th century, I should say, mid to late 19th century, um, up in the air over the brand newly opened port of Yokohama. This was made only 19 years after that 
fuzzy, romantic, soft focus image of China that we just looked at, but you'll see it's a very different visual idiom that's being used here, isn't it? Very sharp focus, very fine. And the image is absolutely crowded with what were in fact the latest up-to-date artifacts of Western technology, namely steamships. So these big steamships and sailing ships have been coming in now from half a dozen Western countries, particularly the United States. That's the one that sent the first steamships that helped persuade the shoguns that they needed to open the country. This is the first port they were allowed to use and it's in the same harbor as the Japanese uh, shoguns headquarters of Edo, which would later be renamed Tokyo. So this was a very intimidating site and it was seen by millions of people and had everything to do with the rise of a lot of panic and pressure to modernize the country. But the person who created this is another very famous and very beloved uh, ukiyo-e artist, Utagawa Sadehide. He made many images of landscapes and the preface to this one in particular is actually rather moving. And it's with this that my contribution to the volume ends, quoting at length from the person who decided to frame this for viewers as a time capsule with an urgent plea to his fellow Japanese citizens to please don't be content with impressionistic literary evocations of landscapes. It's all well and good to have pretty pictures of Mount Fuji, but we, what we urgently need right now he says, is sharply focused renderings, maps effectively, of landscapes that have just come into being and are likely to be superseded very quickly. So here is someone living through rapid change who has become aware, he's kind of living through an earthquake and this whole port has sprung up almost overnight. He's aware that historians in the future will look back and they won't know what existed here. It will be covered over with future memories and future landscapes in much the way that the Mississippi River became covered over. Old roots of it, old meanders and oxbows got cut off by, the, by later ones. He doesn't want that to be lost. So he says, bring out your cameras, take your snapshots, create your maps now so that in a hundred years, this will become a kind of time capsule for those who wanna know how their Japan that they're living in in the future came about because this is a moment of intense change. Um, so on that note, I think I will hand it back to Carolyn for a sign off and then we'll be happy to take your questions. Uh, yeah, thanks, Karin. Uh, well, my sign off is a simple one, uh, which is that uh, once again, here's the jacket of the book with my favorite geological <laughs> time spiral, by the way, which I forgot to mention, is in the shape of a geological object. Um, this is an ammonite, uh, an extinct marine animal. Um, and so, you know, form and function are united in this map. So it, it makes it even better. Okay, I wasn't supposed to add extra content to my closing remarks, but I did anyway. Um, so thank you all for listening. And now we want to hear from you. So please ask questions. That was wonderful and beautiful. And I love all seeing all those images, hearing about it. And I, everyone did as well. And, and one of the questions that uh, came to people's mind was how do you gain confidence in the interpretation of ancient maps? Well, I would say we discovered, have, I've worked with maps of many different kinds and they are not easy to read. I will say that first. We all have a lifetime of accumulated practice and literacy techniques that we bring to maps and we don't even notice it anymore. It's just in the same way that when an English word flashes up on a screen, we read it without thinking about reading. But it is useful to have to work through a foreign language or into a foreign discipline. And I think both Carolyn and I in different ways have had to do that when looking at these images. As scholars, we know how to do research and we understand how very, as historians, we understand how important context is. And I will say very openly, I am relying extensively on the work of brilliant scholars who've put in many decades of work to bring these maps to light, to digitize them at high levels of resolution and to interpret them and bring all the history that they are familiar with to bear on their creation. So we are certainly not entering this de novo. We're in the proverbial 
uh, wording standing on the shoulders of giants. Thank you. Uh, so the other question I wanted to ask that leads into that is, you know, are any of these maps available for public viewing at Stanford? Well, many of them are um, in, in theory, right? In COVID times, the David Rumsey Map Center is unfortunately closed um, until further notice. Is that still correct, Karin? It's closed, right? Um, More or less, but it's gradually opening. By the fall, they hope to be able to have limited service. Sure. Yeah. So a lot of them um, are physically at Stanford, but um, the the maps, a lot of them are available online uh, through the David Rumsey Map Center. Uh, David Rumsey is, uh, as some of you may know, uh, a cartophile, carto cartographer file, whatever. He loves maps. Uh, and so he's digitized a whole bunch of them and you can zoom in and zoom out. Um, so, so you really can try this at home as we await the reopening of many parts of Stanford, including that one with the glorious staircase leading to the David Rumsey Map Center. It's the, the, the staircase alone uh, is worth a visit. The uh, Non-US maps that we've shown today are not within the Rumsey collection, but really if you know the name of a map and you just go to Google Images, quite often you can find um, dealers have been quite quick to take advantage of scanning technology and put high resolution copies of any map that passes through their hands on their websites and they like to leave them up even after the map is no longer for sale. And we've learned in this collaboration how important dealers are within the larger context of this community of people who love and want to study maps. And I want to second what Carolyn said and even underscore it. Uh, the Rumseys have effectively pioneered a kind of digital philanthropy that I think is a very um, creative updating of the philanthropy that the Stanford family themselves engaged in in creating the university. What the Rumseys are trying to do is persuade other map collectors to follow their example and make digital copies of their maps also freely available. And they evidently get a lot of pleasure out of the uses that the public, scholars and non-scholars alike, make of these maps. So I would urge anybody who, who has that level of curiosity to explore both the digital and the, the real physical artifacts when you have a chance. So another question about the Rumsey map collection is how are they, how are the maps in the collection preserved and, and protected? That's an interesting one. This particular collection, which is very distinctive and large within the United States, focuses primarily on printed maps. Uh, that's one of the things David Rumsey caught the value of, realized the value of earlier than many other collectors. And that means that they are relatively more, newer objects than some of the quite rare manuscript materials, say from the medieval or very early parts of the early modern period around the world. Um, often they exist in multiple copies in other uh, archives and other collections as well. So that's just a, just a note about the materials themselves. Not all of them, some of them, but not all of them are extremely rare. It's the amassing of them together and the ability to juxtapose them that's really unusual and the ability to see them on the massive wall size screens that line the walls of the Rumsey Center is also pretty cool. Um, but the, I'm not a librarian, I'm not a preservationist. I will say keeping them out of light is the key thing and handling them with great care. So anyone who walks in the Rumsey Center will be given a quick lesson in our handling of our archival materials. We go in with clean hands. We don't take any ballpoint pens in. Materials are put on stands and arranged carefully and you have to requisition them a, a few hours or a day in advance if you really wanna look at the original materials. And I think simply making digital copies available for the close scanning is actually a step toward preserving the originals. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a question that a lot of people have is, what are your thoughts on Google Maps? Well, uh, okay, I'll, uh, Karin's our, our actual resident trained cartographer uh, here, uh, a historian of cartography, but I love Google Maps. Um, I love, because it, it can do what uh, a, a paper map 
cannot, which is to show where you are in real time relative to your surroundings. And, you know, as all of us know, this is just great for all human relationships, especially, you know, spouses driving down an unfamiliar roadway together. <laughs> you can just, all those fights about where you are are, are, are a thing of the past. And, and this is really uh, an extraordinary, uh, not only a cartographic development, but a social development that you can share your location in real time with, with other people. So I'm a fan, um, but I'll, I'll let Karen weigh in too. Okay, so we'll just do the uh, pro and con. I'm a fan too, but I think that there are ways in which I'm glad, I'm grateful, and I think I benefit from having grown up in an age before Google Maps existed in that I'm not intimidated by or unacquainted with reading paper maps. And this is a technology that our incoming students at the age of 18 have very little relationship to. They're very quick and very agile with um, Google Maps, but Google Maps, because they put us at the center and orient things around us, don't facilitate the kind of location and uh, wayfinding that requires a, a different kind of effort. I won't say more, but a different kind of effort to go into a paper map. I remember arguments in the car, Carolyn, this is, I love that you evoked that, uh, about whether it was appropriate to rotate a map upside down if you're driving in a southerly direction so that you know whether to turn left or right, right? Google Maps, you just do that with a quick clip and the, and the words stay right side up, which didn't used to be true. So there are, there are elements of old style map literacy that I like to bring my students up to. They're quick studies, Stanford students, give them, a, give them a high bar, they're happy to jump over, it's not a problem. But I think they, a lot of them too, kind of get a lot of pleasure out of being immersed in these artifacts, which feel already quaint and nostalgic to them because they're not part of their everyday life. Thank you. Um, and are there examples um, of knowledge you can gain from a physical map that you cannot get from a digital representation, however high resolution the scan is? Interesting. I would say, yes, this is always true of physical artifacts that historians work with and careful scanners will uh, try to include images of the cover material, for instance, and the end papers, if it's an atlas, the watermarks, all these kinds of things that help us gauge how old it was. I'll, I'll just give you a short anecdote and Carolyn might wanna jump in on this too. The University of California at Berkeley happens to have a very nice collection, a couple hundred or more of old Japanese maps. Again, mostly printed materials, not particularly rare in Japan, uh, but they were given by the Mitsui family. So it's called the Mitsui collection until David Rumsey came and helped them scan and put those online. They're now accessible through the David Rumsey website. They had a, you know, a dozen visitors a year who knew about that collection. As soon as they went online, it exploded. I'm one of the people who didn't really discover them until they were put online. And I was looking at these images, I could zoom in, have a, a whole screen filled up with one corner quadrant of a map of Edo and really look in detail and see it. So I thought I better go over to Berkeley and take a look at the originals summoned them out of the vault. They're laid out on a table and I was stunned. Some of them are the size of a piece of notebook paper. Even with a magnifying glass, I couldn't read the text clearly. Mm -hmm. And the engagement with the physical artifact was quite a shock to me, actually. The, it's really important to keep reminding ourselves that the technological interface enables things that were not possible at the time. I've actually started to wonder how many of these literate Japanese needed spectacles to, to read these things, much less to make them. The, the creation of the level of detail that these engravers managed to get into, even woodblock maps now uh, quite impresses me. But it also impressed me that paper was precious and expensive, ink was precious and expensive, and weight was something to be avoided. So these are small maps that could be folded up, tucked into the sleeve of a kimono. I wouldn't have been aware of any of that if I had only engaged with them through the digital interface. So. Our, our, I think Carolyn put it very well when we first started engaging with this whole corpus of material. We're not partisans for either the digital or the paper. We revel in the both and moment that we live in. May it, may it last a long time. Yeah, I, I agree that um, the seeing the, the actual, you know, the, the real map is so important for understanding it because 
a digitized map often makes you think that it's just sort of a map as, you know, like unfolding a AAA road map as, as we used to do before everything was Google Maps. But so many maps are not in that form. Um, they're tucked into books, they're painted as frescoes um, in, in a gigantic room. And all of those things are reminders that maps are not um, you know, given to us by, you know, extraterrestrials, they are profoundly human products that interact with the human body in really important ways that are defined by culture, um, by time, by space. I mean, one example is um, the first map of the Lewis and Clark expedition, uh, you know, this 1804 to 1806 transcontinental expedition um, that was uh, launched by Thomas Jefferson. And when we think of the Lewis and Clark expedition, we think of, you know, these transcontinental maps. But the first map of it was published in the 1814 first published edition of the Lewis and Clark journey. And it's really tiny. And it's all this is map that's like this big and it's folded up like an accordion and tucked into the book. And as Karin was saying with these Japanese maps, you sort of wonder who is the person that could read this thing without like the Hubble Space Telescope to, to magnify it uh, for you. So you imagine a readership of people only under the age of 30, you know, who, who, could, who could look at this. So um, yeah, they're, they're just reminder, the physical objects are reminders that we're dealing with some of the most profoundly human products of our culture. And those comments remind me of one more thing, if I may just add a footnote. And that is that one of the kind of aha moments of the conference for us was that in addition to time being embedded in the maps design, there's durational time that we as viewers spend with the map to understand it, to read it, to navigate with it, or do our imaginary journeys or whatever it is we're doing. And the medium in which the map comes to us affects that durational time quite a bit. So I think we lose, it's easier to lose sight of that, to let that slip out of consciousness when we're dealing with a digital map that we are physically manipulating and we can zoom in exactly where we wanna go. But if you're trying to read a wall size map, you actually physically have to move along the, the floor to see different parts of it. Sometimes you have to pull it down or otherwise do something very physical interacting with it. And then that notion of the duration, or if it's in an atlas, you have to actually flip a physical page. We kind of got into that idea of the, the body's interaction with these materials being part of the story. Thank you, that's great. I, there's a question from um, a comment from David Gleit. He said, I love the free road maps that I got when I was a kid in the 60s. They were available at gas stations such as Shell and Zitco. Are these being scanned and preserved? Yes. Librarians are so quick to grab these things because they know before the rest of us that they're not gonna last. And so Stanford has, in addition to the David Rumsey map room, a massive map collection that basically starts in 1900 and goes forward hundreds of thousands of sheet maps. And that is very cleverly put together. And I would say, if you wanna look at a variety of roadmaps, just head on over to the Mitchell Earth Sciences building and the, the collection is quite astonishing. And, and I'll just add to that. Um, I'm flipping through our book. There's actually one of the essays in the in the in our book uh, by James Ackerman, who's the director of the Newberry. Is that right? The Newberry. Thank you. Uh, library in Chicago has a whole essay on um, that's based in part on those. Uh, maps that we remember, those roadmaps, which is about um, traveling through battlefield sites in the United States, like Gettysburg, and 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 the the attempt to make maps for people who drive around uh, those those sites, um, and and all of the problematics of of what it means to do that. So uh, I think you will enjoy that essay. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Don Levinson says, I particularly love maps showing California and the, uh, as an island and Curiosa. What are your favorite examples of these genres? Oh, one doesn't have to pick a favorite example of the California as an island. There's a whole collection of them that is owned by another collector who has digitized and included them within the David Rumsey digital collection. So you can actually um, go into that and look at over a hundred examples. My favorite 
anecdote about that is that the, it was, I believe the King of Spain who finally said, stop doing this. California is not an island. We do not want any of our map makers in the future to be continuing because again, one of the things we've learned working with maps is the enormous inertia value that a map acquires. And it's, this was less true now than it was in preceding centuries, but it's a huge effort to create a map in the first place. And then they get plagiarized, copied, picked up, used, reused, 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 reissued for often a long period beyond when the information is actually anachronistic. And that's a classic example. The question is about boundaries. Uh, what do these maps and other sources of your work teach you and us about boundaries used and acknowledged by different cultures? Did the Native Americans have established boundaries for their territories? And how far back were territorial boundaries established and how were they acknowledged or marked? Carolyn, do you want to take a crack at that? We can both try. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just, that's a lovely, a very insightful question. You know, maps have many purposes um, over time. Uh, and one of the major ones is saying, you know, this is my stuff and that's your stuff over there. And I am going to draw lines to show you that. Uh, and if you don't obey my lines, I'm going to send in my armies and build walls and do, do all of these, uh, other activities. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would just say that, that, um, the, map, the maps that show the development of boundaries most clearly, um, and you can find a ton of these on just by Googling it, are the, the maps of the United States that begin to be published over the course of the 19th century. And we take for granted that there is a thing called a map of the United States, but it's a genre that had to be invented and developed. And, um, and to become normalized as, as a thing within 25 years of the American Revolution. There's a beautiful book uh, about this, Susan Schulten's Mapping the Nation. Uh, and actually Susan Schulten has an essay in our volume. Um, but the, the mapping of the United States, when you think about it, it's just a series of boundaries. It's the boundary with Canada, which is kind of shifting, the boundary with Mexico, which shifts enormously uh, after the Mexican-American War of 1848, 1849. And then you have to start mapping all the states. And the really the biggest uh, contribution in some ways to cartography in 19th century America is mapping the extent of slavery. Um, and you know, the, uh, so many of the lines and boundaries that we think about are, are uh, in relation to slavery, the Mason-Dixon line, um, and then uh, the Compromise of 1820 and the Compromise of 1860 and the 36-30 parallel, all these gashes march across the country uh, over the course of the 19th century and then have to be physically removed in the aftermath of, of the Civil War as a series of new boundaries that are defined by the railroads uh, begin to lay out a, a different uh, imagination of the United States. And before I hand off to Karen, there's one final really important boundary, which is Frederick Jackson Turner's idea of the frontier in American history. Um, his great uh, essay of 1893 says that the frontier is not just a line, it's, it's, it's the, the essence of America. And that when the frontier ends, uh, American history has ended. Uh, and that's an extraordinary uh, collision of, of a place and a process into one idea of the frontier. Okay, off to you, Karin. So I, my approach to this question, and I agree it's a big one, a very deep question really, is through, it's slightly more global and reaching back into earlier periods in time, right? Appropriate given my own specialty. Um, what, to just touch lightly on some of the main findings of a copious uh, literature that has arisen about this. A lot of scholars are interested in the question of boundaries and boundary making and how that relates to mapping. Uh, what I might observe is or share with you is that not all territorialists, right? Not all people who care about controlling land create maps by any means. So we don't really know very much about pra territorial practices in 
contexts where people had other perfectly adequate ways of marking boundaries, often on the land itself with stones, trees, markers of various kinds, or oral tradition, supplemented sometimes by text, narrative text as a way of describing where the meets and bounds of property were. But what we do see is at the dawn of the early modern age, roughly 1500s, an explosion of mapping going on all over, certainly all over Eurasia and the places that Europeans and Asians were going out into the world to look at, and in some cases, many cases to conquer, we get a huge mapping effort that is all about claiming territory. So it has even been suggested by Dennis Wood, a somewhat provocative polemicist in this field, that this is the beginning of maps. It's always embedded in a state project. I don't go all the way with him on that because there are other branches of mapping that are quite fascinating, including cosmological maps, which grow out of religious and spiritual and philosophical interests, as well as maps of the sky, maps of uh, ancestral lands that don't necessarily, aren't necessarily claimed or owned. So I don't think a map is always about ownership, but a heck of a lot of the time in the modern world, it really is. And anyone who's interested in following up on that, there, there really are some wonderful work, there is wonderful work being done now by historians of maps about the relationship, looking precisely at the timing. Does the map itself generate the idea of the claim that then brings in the armies and brings in the rest of the apparatus Carolyn was talking about to actually make a country like the United States manifest as a real entity on the ground? Any idea about how the 18th century Mississippi River stages were reconstructed from aerial photographs? And then I guess I'd like to add on to this question another one, which is what do you think about the use of maps for tracking environmental changes? Oh, well, we have a colleague, Zephyr Frank, who's doing really important work about using maps to track um, environmental change uh, in Latin America, uh, for example, looking, this is sort of interesting, actually it's very interesting, um, ab about the edges of cities and how monitoring the, the fringes can, can, what's happening at the fringes of cities can help us to see that boundary between what is, I don't know, civilization, uh, if you want to uh, be sort of thinking in those terms and what is kind of beyond that and and um, uh, or at least urban I, I should use a less loaded term what is urban and what is non-urban um, yeah Karen did you want to say yes something? the image that immediately came to mind from this, the latter part of the question about mapping environmental change is the ex really extraordinary new style of mapping that has just become available in the last maybe generation based on GPS devices embedded in animals that allow us to track their migration routes. And as we get time series of those maps, beginning to understand the changes in those migration routes and in their access to resources that are being foisted upon them basically by changes in the, in the globe, including global warming. And this is a great example of a kind of map we don't have for say 500 years ago. We know that indigenous peoples in the Americas were moving as was true in the steppe lands of Eurasia, moving but in systematic cyclical seasonal ways as they pursued food resources. Now we can actually get literal tracking of animals doing precisely that kind of movement within their spheres. And it, I think if nothing else, it, uh, for me, it kind of creates this whole imaginative opening for thinking about the kind of mapping that would have been super to have, but that we, we need to project at least that that genre should exist for people who, Emma Willard may have thought that they had a very loose relationship to territory, but no, they had very precise, and in some ways they were much more knowledgeable about their relationships with their environment than we are. It's just that it involved movement through through a landscape rather than sitting in one place in one of these urban agglomerations that Zephyr and others are tracking. And then just one more thing, I realized that I didn't, uh, we didn't answer the original question about the aerial mapping of, of, 
of the Mississippi. And um, so, yeah, you can see a fair, uh, you know, if you're a trained geologist, you, by flying overhead, uh, you can see a lot of what the earth is telling you. Um, and in the case of the Mississippi, you know, there would be very obvious oxbow lakes, you know, where a, a river has curved so much that it has kind of curved in on itself, um, isolating this the sort of C-shaped lake that we call an oxbow lake. Uh, but this would have been, this aerial information would have been combined with geological information from on the ground. And, you know, one interesting factoid of American history is that um, one of the first places in the country that was explored by geologists and paleontologists uh, as early as the 18 teens and 1820s, uh, at the real infancy of those disciplines, was the Cotton South, uh, or I should say the pre-Cotton South, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama, um, were explored by geologists uh, and planters who wanted to convert it into cotton fields. And so they, um, they extensively surveyed the Mississippi, Alabama, and other major uh, waterways of that area in order to create knowledge about what parts were suitable for cotton um, and also for slavery. So that information from literally from on the ground would have been combined with aerial information to produce those those kinds of maps. I can't resist adding a, a caboose to this train. For those historians really interested in deep time, air photography now enhanced by infrared technology has been absolutely awesome because it has allowed archaeologists flying in planes over places for which they have no documentation to discover simply through the forms that can be seen through a growing jungle that there are ruins of human occupation of the past. And this is one of the technologies that has confirmed much higher population estimates for the Americas before Columbus. People have flown over the Amazon and found these pockets of really black soil and found straight lines that represent aqueducts going right through what is now an overgrown jungle area. And that is an ongoing, very exciting um, domain, I would say, for people who are interested in using maps to understand time. Okay, I'm gonna to try to fit in a couple more questions. Uh, in what way did different countries uh, chart, charts of charts of the oceans and seas differ, if at all, during the age of exploration, like 1500s to 1850? For instance, did France's differ from the English? There comes into being, during the early modern period, a quite global idiom for mapping the oceans, because any exploratory effort by, say, France or England, uh, wants to be documented very quickly and shared with the rest of those competi competing imperial powers so that people can make their land claims and make them effective. The, there's a brief period when the, the Portuguese and the Spanish try to keep their maps sequestered, but it's, it's always a trade-off. If you don't share the maps, you can't really claim the terrain in a way that's, that other people can understand, right? So actually growing out of the nautical tradition that emerged in the Mediterranean basin and it moving out into the larger oceans of the world, I would say very quickly, there's a, a quite recognizable shared idiom, at least across the European countries. And that enters Japan and China through the Jesuits in the late 1500s and early 1600s. Those scholars who care about it master that quickly. Neither of those powers are actually out colonizing, so they don't create many of those kinds of maps, but they definitely know how to read them by the end of the early modern period. I'm sure there are subtle differences, but I think the commonalities are more important. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and this, we have, this is our last question. Uh, what are the top outstanding questions or issues currently being studied in this field today? We've covered a lot of them here. <laughs> Thanks to your questions and answers. I would say issues of boundaries, questions about how indigenous people understood space and how we can represent that with any kind of fidelity, any kind of humanity to uh, and, uh, and kind of empathy with what they were doing. Those are huge questions. Um, counter mapping would be another whole domain, which is trying to put into the hands of people who are not powerful, uh, the tools of cartography so that they can map their own worlds as they experience them and live in them. That's a huge and very interesting domain. Um, bringing non-Western maps 
that are not easily read by Westerners into some kind of form, providing enough subtitles and translation notes that they can actually be become legible for people who are sitting on top of this massive pile of, of Western math, but have never really engaged until the, the last couple generations really seriously with non-Western traditions. Gosh, there's, there's a lot happening in this space and digitization has really allowed more and more people to participate. Yeah, and I'll just add to all of those fascinating areas, uh, the, the ongoing quest with digital maps to show change through time in something more than just a kind of cinematic, we are moving forward, you know, so you can, you can use a whole bunch of big data to create a lovely time lapse map that shows, you know, a forest growing over time or a territory growing over time. But, um, and then you can also play it backwards, which is, which is great and fun uh, and, and helps you to accumulate a lot of data in a single amount of time. But we haven't gone much further beyond that in representing the passage of time in maps digitally. So um, that's a huge area for further exploration um, to transcend uh, this boundary between kind of actual Newtonian time, but then what the early 20th century philosopher Bergson called um, uh, durée, kind of lived time, the, the, the sense that time is passing as you experience it. And you know, when you're having fun, like just now, this hour went by really, really fast. But as you know, when you're bored, time just seems to be like those dolly watches that have wilted into nothingness. So how could a digital map represent that? Uh, I don't know, uh, I'm a historian. So <laughs> we'll leave it to the engineers. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you both. This has been fascinating. Thanks to all, to all the staff that make this possible. It's just a delight to share something we both obviously love. Absolutely. And thank you to all the alumni who came and joined us today. Uh, it was great interacting with you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much and take care.